Hi there, it's Dr. Ken Berry. You know, I've been on a mission for the last eight years to improve the health of every person on this planet. And I'm committed to continuously providing you with the up-to-date information you need to improve your health and to improve the health of those you love by adopting the principles of a proper human diet. As we step into the new year, I've decided to delve even deeper into the intricacies of medicine and nutrition and farming and battling the twin Goliaths of big food and big pharma. But I need your help. To further this mission, I've decided to pull back the curtain a little bit to let you see behind the scenes. I want you to see what goes on firsthand behind the YouTube videos, behind my office. I want you to hear the conversations that aren't publicized but are vital to understand the big picture and the big battle that we're all in. To make this happen, I've assembled a dedicated team. Their role, not just to help me spread the word, but also to equip you with the knowledge you need, the armor of knowledge, through the content that we create to allow you to reclaim, to recapture your best health. It's a partnership between you and I. Once you empower yourself with this information and apply it to your life, you become a catalyst of change across the entire nation, promoting concepts like a proper human diet, regenerative farming, and regenerative ranching. In this video, I'll take you along on a recent drive with my team, shedding some light on the battle we have with big food and big pharma, and all the regulations that hamstring the little guys like you and me and keep us from attaining our best health and best farming practice. It's an eye-opener, and I hope you'll find it insightful. If you enjoy this content, please remember to hit that subscribe button, the like button, the thumbs up, drop a comment, and share this video on your favorite social media. Taking these few simple steps, you can break the algorithm that throttles much of the content that people out there are hungry for and really need. Together, you and I, we can change the world. Driving through Camden, Tennessee, Benton County, where Nisha and I live, you can see all the empty storefronts. Look at this. It's gonna be a hotel right there. It was torn down. Obviously, there's the ubiquitous mandatory Chinese restaurant with crappy food and Mexican restaurant. They got pretty good food, actually. But small towns like this are suffering because of the way the supply chain is set up. It's very unfashionable. It's also cost more to buy something local rather mm -hmm. than for somebody to start a manufacturing concern here. Make just some little widget and try to sell it locally. That just doesn't work anymore because of the way the federal government has set up our economy. Right. And that's why when you buy regenerative meat currently, it's so expensive, right? Because there's so many regulations that a processing facility or a ranch has to go by. It's onerous for the small guy. In many cases, those regulations, you know who actually wrote them? The big four meat producers. Wow. Yeah, they wow. actually wrote the regulation. It's owners for them too, but they made so many billions of dollars, they just hire a full-time employee to take care of that and that's it. It's no sweat off their nose. Mm -hmm. But for a small farm, small ranch, a small concern, a small processor, it puts them out of business. Yes. If they try to comply with that regulation, it puts them out of business. Are we talking about like cost? Like yeah, the, the yeah. Cost? For a USDA certified facility, they've got to have a dedicated bathroom just for the USDA inspector. Wow. Like they can't use the regular bathroom. Mm -hmm. what, what, are you been, what are you even talking about? What do you pee differently than everybody else? You poop <laughs> differently? Why can't you use the same damn mm -hmm. bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. But there's all these regulations that are just weird and unhelpful that a small processor, a small rancher who wants to sell meat to the public. That's the key. Yeah. The rancher can eat his own meat. He can give away the meat. He can sell the meat from his ranch very often, and that's fine. But if he wants to sell it to the public off the ranch, that's when all the regulations kick in. Wow. And there's actually legislation in front of the U.S. House right now called the Prime Act that's trying to lessen those onerous regulations. Whether it's going to pass or not remains to be seen. There are some congressmen that are acutely aware of this, and it's strangling the small processor, the small rancher and small communities. There's nothing that can be done here because you can't make a profit unless you go to scale. Right. You gotta go to a nationwide, if not a worldwide scale, in order to be profitable. One thing I admired about what Will Harris said was when 
the subject was brought up about him and how many states he was in. He was unsatisfied. Yeah. He is covering all the states and he's unsatisfied with that. Well, he ships to all 48 states. All 48 states. But Will's a smart guy. He's a common sense guy. He knows that it, that's not economically sustainable right. to ship a, a package of ribeyes from Georgia to Washington State. Mm -hmm. Come on. There should be a ranch in Washington State. There should be a ranch in Utah, just like his. There should be one in Wyoming. Every single state should have multiple white oak pastures so that you're not having to put this meat on a truck and ship it across the country, or worse, put it on a boat and ship it around the world. A lot of people in America don't have any idea that even though their meat that they're buying it says product of the USA, yes, that animal was raised in New Zealand. Wow. Or Argentina, wow. or China, God forbid. Yeah, that's where your meat's coming from, and it still can legally, because of some of that regulation I was talking yeah. about earlier, it can say product of the USA. If the carcass was shipped here, and then it was processed in the United States, it can say product of the USA. Yeah, 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 and I think that's a great red flag. If anybody sees a package of meat that says product on it, that's a commodity. Yeah. You don't want to buy that. You right. want to buy a package that says meat. Yes. Right? If it's a product, there's some foolishness going on in mm -hmm. the background. There's mm -hmm. some kind of bullshit. Mm -hmm. Once people start to realize that the words on the package matters, matters a lot. If I had a farm, I would say raised and processed in the United States. I would say what state? Raised and processed in Tennessee in the USA. Mm -hmm. And so I hope every Virginia to rancher is following that. And when people see product on a package of meat, that didn't come from the United States. Think about it. If you were a rancher, would you put product of USA? No, no you would never put that. You would put raise regeneratively on OB Farms in Holiday, Tennessee. You'd be proud of that. Yeah. And so part of this is we got to get the ranchers in gear. They got to step it up. But then the bigger part of the equation is the consumers. Yes. Have got to start thinking when they buy food. Because if you don't think, when you're buying food, you're going to wind up buying Franken food. You're going to wind up buying highly processed, inflammatory food. You're not going to be buying real, actual human food. Mm -hmm. Because the corporations, in the end, don't give a damn about your health. They care about your money. Yeah. That's what they want. Yeah. They want to get in your wallet and get their cut. That's all they care about. If the food they're selling you slowly makes you sick, they can care less. Yeah, when it comes to education, obviously when we're talking about YouTube and social media and platforms, that's scalable education. We can put that all over the world, all over the country, and, and it can reach millions and millions of people, right? But when we're bringing it back down into those local markets or those local states or those counties, right? What do you envision when it comes to education and getting these regenerative farms rolling? It's so hard to advertise to people in small communities. I had a medical practice here in Camden for 20 years, and I spent so much money on Facebook ads and other social media ads trying to market to, to my county and the five counties surrounding. I would have a service that I'd been offering for 10 years, and then we would have somebody come in the front door saying, you do so-and-so? I had no idea you do so-and-so, even though I'd spent thousands of dollars advertising it. It's just like you can't penetrate that. And so I think in the small communities, it's just probably gonna have to be word of mouth. Direct emails, direct text messages saying, hey, we've got this, do you want this? It's really hard to do that. Whereas I feel like in a bigger city, it's much easier to mass market to the population. But in small communities, it's very hard because everybody kind of lives in their own little bubble. And very often they don't interact with the community enough to hear about things. So unless they're going to church, they're going to some civic organization, they're you know getting out in public, they just don't hear about stuff if it's not advertised. FFA has a great potential to do good things, but currently every FFA program in high school has been co-opted by Big Meat, Big Pharma, Big Ag, Big Seed. And so what the Ag teachers are trying to teach the students, and I don't blame them for this, I get it, because you want your student to go on to be a successful farmer. And if you're teaching them sex, uh, techniques that are not profitable, you're not helping them. Right. I get that. But at the same time, is it sustainable? Is it regenerative? Is it a model that's going to last for the next 200 years? I think that question needs to be asked in the FFA programs. And maybe teach them two tracks and say, well, if you want to do the antibiotics and the steroids and the feedlot and, and the high production factory model, here's how you do that. But there is another way. There's a regenerative way. And you can actually sell that meat because people seek it out. They want it. People who know better 
want to do better. And so maybe teach both models currently until we've scaled back up regenerative branching so that it, that becomes the predominant method that's taught in school. I think that's such a great way of looking at it because obviously the tide won't turn overnight. But if we start to penetrate, we start to have the conversations, put the seeds in the ground. They can grow over time. And like you said, and what we've been talking about, it really is an investment in the future. We may not be around to see everything fully come to fruition. Can we be the spark that lights the fire? Exactly. And I think if we light enough fires and enough hearts and minds, then it's going to become a self-perpetuating movement that is just continuously seeking out the best quality food from the most local source. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going to revive these little communities. That's what's going to wake these little towns up out of their slumber, out of their slumber of poverty, mm -hmm. and say, hey, there's a better way. We can start to employ people again and actually still make a profit. That's when I think everybody in small communities is going to wake up and say, hey, I want some of that too. Absolutely. I think that when we talked about the impact, uh, not just economically, but really just kind of going back to things that work, things that are valuable just as a whole, and how you treat Adam, how you treat the land. I mean, these are all amazing principles that the young people and the next generation of farmers and ranchers that are coming up need to know. Absolutely. Otherwise, like we were talking about earlier, they just think it's the norm because grandpa did. And they just think it's the norm because they're, this is what their teachers are telling them and whatnot. But yet, there's a piece of history, there's a piece of that puzzle that they didn't see. Yeah. And to be able to bring that back and start those conversations of, at least we have a fighting chance. The FFA programs, they want to teach the latest science very often the ancient principles of treating the soil properly and the land properly and the animals properly is much more powerful over the long term, not for short term profit, mm -hmm. but for long term yes. sustainability and regeneration. The ancient principles of animal husbandry and land health, they're much more powerful and that's what's going to take us into the next century and the next and the next mm -hmm. and still be able to raise real healthy food. Because if we keep doing the chemicalized, sterilized method of farming and ranching, we don't have many more generations until we're out of soil. So 